Hello everybody, Hooded Cobra Commander 788 here, and this is a special video. On this channel, we have reviewed every vintage G.I. Joe item from the year 1982. It's the first year we've actually completed. So, I'm going to do an overview of 1982. We can do that now. I've already done in-depth reviews of each item, but just for fun, let's do a brief overview of every G.I. Joe toy from 1982. This is Breaker, G.I. Joe's communications officer. The first G.I. Joe figure I ever purchased as a child in 1982 was Breaker. This figure, like all 1982 figures, is a straight arm figure, meaning he has articulation at the elbow, but he did not have the swivel at the arms that G.I. Joe figures would have starting in 1983. The figure included a helmet, a communications headset, and a backpack. Breaker did not include a weapon. All of these 1982 figures were reissued in 1983, but the 1983 editions included the updated articulation on the arms. So they had the swivel at the arms, and they had some other minor molding differences. For instance, the waist piece uh, and the screw hole where the backpack would peg in. Uh, those were slightly different from the 1982 releases. This is Cobra, the basic unspecialized Cobra Trooper. His file card simply calls him Cobra, with code name The Enemy. So this is an army builder, and Cobra figures did debut in 1982, but a little later than G.I. Joe figures. When G.I. Joe was first launched, it did not have any enemy troopers. The Cobra figures were introduced in 1982, but just a bit later than their G.I. Joe counterparts. This figure was reissued in 1983 with the updated articulation on the arm. Cobra included a single accessory, a Dragunov sniper rifle. This figure was available at retail on a card, but it was also available with the 1982 Cobra Missile Command Headquarters. This is the Cobra Officer. His file card simply calls him Cobra Officer, codenamed the enemy, like the previous figure. This figure looks very similar to Cobra, but there are some slight differences. The Cobra Officer is a bit more detailed, and he has a silver Cobra emblem on his chest. The figure comes with a single accessory, an AK-47 rifle. Uh, the Cobra Officer was reissued in 1983 with the updated articulation at the arms. The figure was available at retail, carded. It was also packed with the Sears exclusive Cobra Missile Command Headquarters. This is Flash, G.I. Joe's laser rifle trooper. A lot of kids were drawn to this figure because of the striking orangey-red pads. This figure also brought science fiction into G.I. Joe. He had a futuristic laser rifle. This figure was very similar to another 1982 figure, Grand Slam, but there are some differences. The figure was reissued in 1983 with some molding differences and updated articulation at the arms. The figure included a helmet, a clear visor, a laser rifle, and a backpack. This is Grunt, G.I. Joe's infantry trooper. This is as close as G.I. Joe gets to an army builder, an undifferentiated trooper. But Grunt is not a generic soldier. He is an individual with his own name and backstory. This figure was reissued in 1983 with some updated molding and articulation at the arms. The figure included a helmet, an M16, and a backpack. This is Rock and Roll, G.I. Joe's machine gunner. This was a special looking figure with crossed gold ammunition belt bandoliers, and he had a colorful background described on his file card. The figure was reissued in 1983 with some updated molding and articulation. The figure included a helmet, a machine gun, and a bipod. That bipod is removable and it is a frequently missing accessory. This is Scarlet. Her file card lists her specialty as counterintelligence. She is one of the rare female G.I. Joe characters, the only female character from 1982. This figure is shown not on a battle stand here because she did not have holes in the bottom of her feet to accommodate foot pegs. Scarlet was one of only two figures released in 1982 made of entirely unique parts. She did not reuse any parts from any other figure. Scarlet was reissued issued in 1983 with updated articulation at the arms. She includes a single accessory, a crossbow. 
This is Short Fuse, G.I. Joe's Mortar Soldier. This is one of the most difficult figures of the year to complete if you want all of the variations. There were three different moldings of his mortar, and he had three text variations of his file card, all of which gave him different file names. Short Fuse was reissued in 1983 with updated articulation and molding. The figure included a helmet, a visor, a backpack, a mortar and a removable mortar bipod. This is Snake Eyes, G.I. Joe's Commando. This figure is probably the most memorable figure from 1982. The figure is made entirely of black plastic with no paint applications. This is the only figure of the year with no paint applications. Hasbro conceived of this as a cost-cutting measure. By cutting all of the paint applications for one figure, they opened up room in the budget for additional paint applications on other figures. Snake Eyes was reissued in 1983 with updated articulation and molding. The figure included an Uzi and an explosives pack. Here we have a figure that may have gained paint applications thanks to the cost savings on Snake Eyes. This is Stalker, G.I. Joe's Ranger. The unfortunate name of Stalker, it has not aged well, but at the time it did not have the meaning that it has now. Stalker was the only African American character in 1980. 82, and the only figure with camouflage. This example unfortunately has broken thumbs. The figure is made of a light green plastic which was notoriously fragile. Stalker was reissued in 1983 with updated molding and articulation. Stalker has a green beret, a light green uniform with dark green striped camouflage. The figure included a single accessory, the M32 pulverizer submachine gun. This is Zap. G.I. Joe's Bazooka Soldier and the most difficult figure to collect intact. The figure was made of a light green plastic that is extremely fragile. He is standing here without a battle stand because placing his foot on a foot peg will inevitably cause the foot to break. I also do not place his weapons in his hands because that will either break his thumbs or break the handle on his bazooka. Zap was reissued in 1983 with updated molding and articulation. The figure included a helmet, a backpack, and a bazooka. There are three variations on that bazooka. The earliest ones came with two handles. That was replaced with a single thin-handled bazooka. And then when he was reissued in 1983, he had a single thick-handled bazooka. This figure is more difficult to complete than short fuse. If you want a complete set of 1982 figures, this is the one that will give you the most headaches. There was one figure available in a mail-away offer in 1982, Cobra Commander. His file card said his code name is Enemy Leader. As the leader of Cobra, he was a pretty important character, but there were only two ways to get Cobra Commander in 1982. One way was to take advantage of a mail-away offer and receive the figure through the mail. The other way was to purchase the Sears exclusive Missile Command headquarters. The earliest releases of Cobra Commander had a simplified Cobra emblem on his chest. Collectors refer to this as the Mickey Mouse Cobra Commander. That was quickly fixed in 1982 and later releases had the standard Cobra emblem on his chest. In 1982 the figure was made of entirely unique parts. It did not reuse any parts from any other action figure. But when the figure was released in 1983 with updated articulation on the arm, he did reuse the arms of the 1983 Cobra officer. Cobra Commander included one accessory, his Venom laser pistol. The pistol could be attached to to the molded-on recharging pack on his back. Moving on to the vehicles, in 1982, G.I. Joe had four vehicles that included action figures, and a couple that did not have action figures. This is the Vamp, the multi-purpose attack vehicle, the closest G.I. Joe has to a Jeep. It is in light green plastic. It has a double-barrel gun on a turret. It has two removable fuel cans in the back. It has a green steering wheel, which is often lost. The vamp included a driver, Clutch. Clutch had a unique chest and back piece and a little bit more paint application than most figures of that.
that year had, he included a single accessory, his helmet. This is the Heavy Artillery Laser, better known as the HAL. It included an action figure, the Laser Artillery Trooper, Grand Slam. This towed weapon could be hitched on other G.I. Joe vehicles, and it brought another science fiction element to G.I. Joe. It was in a dark green, which gave it a military look, despite the fact that it was a futuristic laser gun. Grand Slam had a lot of similarities to Flash, the laser rifle trooper, but there were some differences. He had a different head, he actually reused Grunt's head. The green plastic was a darker color of green, and he had black gloves and boots. Grand Slam included a helmet and a clear visor. Grand Slam was reissued in 1983 with updated molding and articulation, and there was a second version of Grand Slam released with the jump jetpack, but his orangey red pads were changed to silver. This is the mobile missile system, better known as the MMS. It included an action figure, Hawk, the missile commander. It was in dark green and it included three large missiles. It could be converted to two different modes. It could be in mobile mode, it could hitch onto other G.I. Joe vehicles and be towed, or it could be placed in stationary mode and could be operated by a control panel with a detachable stand. That detachable stand is often missing. Hawk looks like a generic figure, but he was an important character. He was the leader of G.I. Joe. It was unusual to put such an important character with what many considered to be a plain vehicle. Hawk was reissued in 1983 with updated articulation and molding. He included a helmet and a clear visor. This is the Mobat, the motorized battle tank. It was a special vehicle in 1982 because it was in fact motorized. It was battery operated and it would really go. It would move forward and backward and turn left and right. You could control it by moving the top turret, which served as a switch. The tank was in dark green with exceptional detail. The Mobat included an action figure, the tank commander, Steeler. Steeler is made of that fragile, light green plastic, so you do have to be cautious with this figure. Steeler also had some special metallic gold paint applications, and those tended to wear away very easily. It is not easy to find a Steeler action figure in mint condition. Steeler's accessories included a helmet, a large dark gray visor, and an Uzi submachine gun that was a reissue of the Uzi that was included with Snake Eyes. The Mobat was reissued in 1983, and the Steeler action figure was updated with some new molding and articulation at the arms. G.I. Joe had three boxed vehicles and weapons that did not include action figures. This is the FLAC, the Field Light Attack Cannon. It is a very basic anti-aircraft cannon. It has a single seat, it can rotate and elevate, and it has some nice detail. But it is short on features, it does not have wheels, it cannot be hitched to another G.I. Joe vehicle. This is my least favorite of the 1982 boxed weapon systems. This is the Jet Mobile Propulsion Unit, better known as the Jump Jet Pack. This set was released in 1982 without an action figure. It consisted of a launch pad that stood on four feet, a control and recharging panel, a jet pack that attached to an action figure exactly the same as a standard backpack. There was also a laser rifle that clipped onto the figure's arm. The laser rifle and the jet pack were connected by a flexible black wire. This set was unremarkable in 1982. In 1983 it was reissued, but it included an action figure. It included an updated version of Grand Slam. Finally we get to the Rapid Fire Motorcycle, better known as the Ram. This is without a doubt my favorite of the driverless vehicles from 1982. The Ram Motorcycle is in light green plastic. It includes a large side-mounted Gatling gun. It has two removable saddlebags, those are often missing, and it has a kickstand. Even though Though this vehicle did not include a driver, it was a lot of fun when paired with breaker or rock and roll. And finally we get to the only playset that was available in 1982, and it was not available widely, it was sold exclusively at Sears. This is the Cobra Missile Command Headquarters. This playset is entirely made out of cardboard, so it is very fragile. It was only available at a single store, so it is very rare. The Cobra Missile Command Headquarters came with three action figures, the three Cobra action 
figures that were available in 1982. It was packaged with Cobra Commander, the Cobra Soldier, and the Cobra Officer. In 1982, of course, it would have included the straight arm versions of all three of those figures, and the earliest releases of the Missile Command headquarters would have had the rare Mickey Mouse Cobra Commander. The later issues from 1982 would have had the Cobra Commander with the standard Cobra emblem. When the set was reissued in 1983, it included the updated versions of all three of those figures with the updated articulation at the arm. The set included a cardboard file card holder, which is often missing. A lot of collectors don't really consider it to be part of the set. It could hold the three file cards that came with the included figures. There was one other G.I. Joe item released in 1982. It was not a figure or a vehicle, but it was officially released by Hasbro. It was not a licensed product. It was the Collector Display Case. The Collector Display Case featured some awesome G.I. Joe artwork on the front, and it could be opened up to store 12 G.I. Joe action figures and some accessories and file cards. The back of the display case included a photograph of some of the 1982 figures, and it demonstrated how you could use it either as a carrying case or as a display. Inside the display case, there were compartments for 12 action figures, a space for combat command file cards, and a weapons armory. The set came with a sheet of labels for the plastic strips that covered the compartments for the action figures, so you could place the labels in any configuration you wanted. There you have it, 1982 all in one place. Thank you for joining me for the first year of G.I. Joe, A Real American Hero. I am close to completing other years from the vintage line, but we're not quite there yet. When I do complete those years, we'll do another retrospective like this one. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up on YouTube and subscribe to the YouTube channel and hit the notification bell and share this video with your friends. That's what helps this channel grow. I am on social media on Facebook and Twitter, and I have a website, hcc788.com. Thanks to all my patrons who make these videos possible. If you'd like to support the channel in that way, please check out my Patreon for some special perks. I will continue to make full vintage G.I. Joe toy reviews each week, so please join me, and always remember only G.I. Joe is G.I. Joe.